Reading through the Bible in one year, May 4th, Numbers 11, Psalm 48, Isaiah chapter 1, and Hebrews chapter 9. New book day. Now, the people began complaining openly before the Lord about hardship. When the Lord heard, his anger burned, and the fire from the Lord blazed among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was named Taborah, because the Lord's fire had blazed among them. I'm looking for the note on this because it's good. Uh, so Taborah, this is just a general complaint by the people. In judgment, fire breaks out in the outlying parts of the camp. On other occasion, uh, occasions, Moses' intercession halts God's judgment. Tabra means burning. Uh, like other place names in the Bible, it commemorates the events that occurred there. We get some good ones. So again, people, and I've heard people complain about this, like, oh, why did God kill them? Just because they were going through a hard time and complaining to God. Shouldn't God have just given them whatever they wanted? The thing to remember about this is God is taking care of literally all of their needs. Everything. He's taking care of their food, taking care of their water, taking care of everything. So we're going to see a lot of complaints happen in this text. And remember, every one of these complaints is not a complaint against Moses. It's a complaint against God. And the types of complaints we're seeing, which we'll see some of here shortly, they're saying, God isn't able to take care of our needs. God isn't capable to take care of these things for us. Remember, what have they seen so far? They've seen all the plagues caused by God. They've seen him split the people from the Egyptian army with a curtain of a horrible storm with lightning and thunder. The, the, the army was terrified to come through it to where the people were. They've seen the Red Sea split in two so that there are walls of water on either side. And then they walked through on dry land. They went to the mountain of God, where God sat on top of the mountain in flame and fire and an earthquake that lasted the whole time he was talking with them. And God spoke to them directly with lightning firing the whole time around them and a giant, uh, it was a, a trumpet sound going the whole time that God was speaking to the people and he terrified them. Because of, his, because of his speech to them. They understood what he said, but they were terrified and they said, Moses, you be our representative. You go to God and you tell us what God says and that's enough for us. We'll do whatever he says. Remember that? All of these things have taken place. God has been taking care of their food, taking care of their water, taking care of everything that they've needed. And in the next 40 years, as they remain in the wilderness, he's going to take care of their clothing as well. He's going to keep them safe from their enemies. And so long as they do as they promised and follow his commands and do what he has said, he's going to keep their enemies at bay and he will keep pestilence out of the camp. However, this is a different type of covenant. Remember, the first covenant that was with Abraham, before Abram, what was that covenant? It was a covenant of grace. What did he ask of Abraham? What did he say to Abraham? You must do this, that, or the other, and then I'll do these things for you? Nothing. In fact, the whole covenant itself, and you can read this in Genesis 15, God is speaking to Abraham saying, I will do this for you. I will make, uh, I will give you this land that you see before you. I will make from you so many children that you won't be able to number them. I will defend them. I will protect them. I will do all of this for you. Why? Was it because he was a special person? No. It wasn't because of his, his, his righteousness or anything else. It was because he heard God and believed God. And that was it. God said, I'm going to do all of these things. And he said, I believe you. I trust you. And Abraham, as we'll read later in, uh, is it? No, Hebrews uh, 11 is coming up in a couple days. As we'll read through in Hebrews 11, Abraham was given all of these promises 
and not a single thing was given to him during the time of his life. But even up to his death, he still believed God would do what he said. So that's where we are here. Now the people are coming out of the land of Egypt. They have all of the promises. They spoke to God directly. They see God actively acting in their midst. And we get people today saying, if God would just open the heavens and say, I'm here, then I would believe. But what do they have? They have a tornado of fire by night. They have a cloud covering during the day and another tornado that leads them wherever they're going. They see God in the tabernacle light the thing up as if there's lights inside. When Moses spends time with God, he comes back and his face shines. It glows in front of them and it terrifies them so he keeps himself covered. They see this God acting every single day, but they still have the audacity to, instead of going to uh, to Moses saying, you know, hey, we'd really like some cheeseburgers. Can we do that? Is that a thing we can do out here? What they do instead is they complain. Why are we walking so far? Why am I not getting the thing that I want? They're not going to God and asking. They're not going to Moses and asking Moses as the representative of God to go to God and say the people would like this. They're complaining to God. They're complaining to Moses. And they're complaining to other people trying to sow discord among them. This is why God does exactly what he does. A fire from the Lord blazed among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. That's where these grumblings are beginning. But this is only the start. Verse 4. The riffraff among them had a strong craving for other food. The Israelites wept again, again more complaining, and said, Well, who will feed us meat? We remember free fish when we ate in Egypt. Yeah, when you were slaves, where you were harshly treated, when God went and rescued you, But they're like, oh, but we had fish and and, and cucumbers and melons and leeks, onions and garlic. Their breath had to be horrible. But now, now our appetite is gone and there's nothing to look at but this, this manna. See, they're dismissing what God has given them. The manna itself resembled coriander seed and its appearance with that was like that of bdellium. The people walked around and gathered it, and they ground it on a a pair of grinding stones or crushed it in a mortar, then boiled it in a cooking pot and shaped it into cakes. And it tasted like pastry cooked in the finest oil. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Again, this is God feeding and taking care of the people. They don't go to God and say, God, you know, we'll be great with this. We would appreciate it. If you could provide for us uh, the ability to catch some fish. You know, can, can we go buy some bodies of water we can fish for? it? And then I think that that would be fun. You know, the, the whole community to co- could come together. We could do this together, right? But what they do instead is they just whine. They're grumbling between, sorry, behind the scenes, uh, grumbling around everywhere and not going to God directly. The Moses heard the people, family after family, weeping at the entrance of their tents. And the Lord was very angry. And Moses was also provoked. So Moses asked the Lord, Why have you brought such trouble on your servant? Now he's starting to grumble. Why are you angry with me? And why do you burden me with all these, your people? Or with all these people? Did I conceive these people? Did I, carry, did I give birth to them so that you should tell me, carry them at your breast as a nursing mother carries a baby to the land that you swore to give to their ancestors? Where can I get meat to give all these people? For they are weeping to me. Give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. They are too much for me. If you are going to treat me like this, please kill me right now. If I have found favor with you, And don't let me see my misery anymore. Again, Moses is now grumbling. The Lord answered Moses, 
Bring me 70 men from Israel known to you as elders and officers of the people, and take them to the tent of meeting and have them stand there with you. Then I will come down and speak, uh, yeah, and speak with you there. I will take some of the spirit who is on you and put the spirit on them, and they will help you bear the burden of this people so that you do not have to bear it by yourself. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in readiness for tomorrow, for you will eat meat because you wept in the Lord's hearing. Who will feed us meat? We were better off in Egypt. The Lord will give you meat and you will eat. You will eat, not for one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes nauseating to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and wept before him. Why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses replied, I, I'm in the middle of a people with 600,000 foot soldiers. Yet you say, I will give them meat and they will eat for a month. If flocks and herds were slaughtered for them, would they be enough? Or if all the fish of the sea were caught for them, would they have enough? The Lord answered Moses, Is, is Yahweh's arm weak? Now you will see whether or not uh, what I have promised will happen to you. Moses went out and told the people uh, the words of the Lord. Here we go. He brought 70 men from the elders of the people and had them stand around the tent. Here we go. Turning off my phone. Turning off my phone. And had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord descended in the cloud and spoke to him. He took some of the spirit who was on Moses and placed the spirit on these 70 elders. As the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they never did it again. They only prophesied the one time. Two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other one Madad. The spirit rested on them, and they were among those listed, but had not gone out to the tent. This is showing it's not Moses doing it, but it's God doing it. And they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Madad are, are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, uh, assistant to Moses since his youth, responded, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses asked them, Are you jealous on my account? If only all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would make his spirit, or would place a spirit on them. Then Moses returned to the camp, along with the elders of Israel. And a wind sent by the Lord came up and blew quail in from the sea. And it dropped them all around the camp. And they were flying a three feet off the ground for about a day's journey in every direction. And the people were up all that day and night, and all the next day gathering quail. The one who took the least gathered sixty bushels. And they spread them all out around the camp. While the meat was still between their teeth, Before it was even chewed, the Lord's anger burned against the people, and the Lord struck them with a very severe plague. So they named that place Kibroth Hatava, which means graves of calling, because there they buried the people who had craved the meat. From Kibroth, sorry, from Kibroth Hatava, the people moved on to Hazaroth and remained there. Let's move on to Psalm 48. The Lord is great and highly praised in the, in the city of our God. His holy mountain rising splendidly is the joy of the whole earth. Mount Zion, the summit of Zaphon, is the city of the great king. God is known as a stronghold in its citadels. Look, the kings assembled. They advanced together. They looked and froze with fear. They fled in terror. Trembling seized them there, agony like that of a woman in labor. As you wrecked the ships of Tarshish with the east wind, just as we heard, so have we seen in the city of the Ar sorry, in the city of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. In the city of our God, 
God will establish it forever. God, within your temple, we contemplate your faithful love. Like your name, God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Mount Zion is... Oh, I lost my spot. Uh, Your right hand is filled with justice. Mount Zion is glad. Judah's villages rejoice because of your judgments. Go around Zion. Encircle it. Count its towers. Note its ramparts and tour its citadels so that you can tell a future generation. This, this God is our God forever and ever. He will always lead us. Let's move on now to Isaiah chapter 1. And since we're in a new book, let's go ahead and read the introduction. Isaiah lived during the decline of Israel in the shadow of Assyria. He spoke the word of God to a people who were, quote, deaf and blind, unquote, and who refused to listen to his warnings of looming disaster. He warned that the sin of the people of Judah would bring God's judgment. He also declared that God is sovereign and would use Cyrus the Persian who wouldn't be born for many, many years, to return them from exile. The book speaks of a, quote, servant, unquote, a, quote, man of sorrows, unquote, who would be, quote, pierced for our transgressions, unquote, accomplishing God's purpose of salvation. The final chapters give a beautiful description of a new creation in which God will rule as king, judging the wicked, and establishing eternal peace. Isaiah prophesied about 740 to 700 BC, possibly till the 680s. Now, before we start, understand that from where we were before, we're now jumping further ahead into the future, right? So, as we're reading through the Pentateuch, Uh, The people haven't even come into the promised land yet. But eventually, they do go into that promised land. And then they are given the land itself. And then almost immediately, they fall, uh, after the death of of the the people who take over the land, and after the death of those, sorry, the children of those people, the people immediately fall into um, uh, many, many years of idolatry. And God allows them to be taken over, and then they come back. And this is just a quick snapshot of their history. But uh, they're, they're, they're taken over, and then God builds up a judge for them, and then they conquer the people who are conquering them. And you see this occur uh, throughout the book of Judges. It's If you look at a map, it's not the entire people, but it's different groups of the people all over the place who have things like this happen. And it's a uh, the, the reason why it's written that way, or the reason why it's given like that to us, is so that we see that this kind of, of idolatry was happening everywhere among the people of Israel. So eventually the people ask for a king. God sends them a king, in giving them the king that they wanted, much like the meat we just saw. They got the thing that they wanted, but it proved to be poison for them. It proved to be only trouble, and that was Saul, Saul of Kish, their first uh, king. The second king is David, and then we'll go through the story of uh, both Saul and uh, King David in First and Second um, uh, Samuel. Then we're going to start going through the books of the kings, where it starts uh, describing for us uh, the, the rule of Solomon, Right, And then his own personal issues, which eventually lead to a splitting of the church, not of the church, but of the people. And it'll be broken into Judah by itself. And then you will have the rest of the kingdom. And that's the rest of, of Israel. And so when we see this here and it says, well, this is concerning... um. Uh, Israel itself, right? Or we'll see others that say, yeah, this is, excuse me, this is concerning Judah and Jerusalem. We'll see them laid out this way and we'll see it, it separated into the two different camps. Even when we go through the book of the Kings and we go through the first and second Chronicles, 
Um, it's going to describe for us, these are all the things that happen in Israel, and then these are all the things that happen in Judah or in Jerusalem. And you'll see them as two separate groups. So as we go through these, uh, these prophets, through the major prophets and even the minor prophets who are to come after this, you'll see that one is written to one people and one is written to another. This vision, as we read in verse 1, is a vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw during the reigns of kings Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah. Reasonably good. Or, sorry, there, there were some reasonably good kings in here, but we'll see that. Listen, heavens, uh, and pay attention, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have raised up children and brought them, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's feeding trough, but Israel does not know, and my people, people whom God created and saved and gave them the land and took care of all of their needs, my people do not understand. O oh, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity. Remember, there's three levels of sin, regular sin, there's uh, transgressions, and then there's iniquity, which is the deepest level of sin. That, that's a willful sin that you desire to commit. Brood of evildoers, depraved children. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on him. Why? Why do you want more beatings? Why do you keep on rebelling? The whole head is hurt and the whole heart is sick. He's saying the, the, the entire people are just utterly sick from this. They're all wicked. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, no spot is uninjured. Wounds, welts, and festering sores, not cleansed, bandaged, or soothed with oil. Your land is desolate. Your cities burn down. Foreigners devour your fields right in front of you. A desolation, like a place demolished by foreigners. Daughter Zion is abandoned. Like a shelter in a vineyard. Like a shack in a cucumber field. Like a besieged city. If the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, had not left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would resemble Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are all your sacrifices to me? asks the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the, uh, the, fa <coughs> excuse me, the fat of well-fed cattle. I have no desire for the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. The people thought that their that their um, sacrifices would be pleasing to God while they go out at night and go worship Moloch or Baal. While they go worship the Asherim or the the the, the host of heaven, all the stars in the in the sky. When they worship the green trees and plants and all of these things and have their little love orgies and all of that, while they worship all of these other uh, all of these demons. They think that, well, we're still the people of God. We're genetically linked to Abraham. So that's what they think. But they're missing the point. And that's what God is saying. Even all of your sacrifices that you give to me are as rubbish. It's garbage. It's worthless to me because they're not doing it with the right heart. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who requires this of you? The, 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 the trampling of my courts. Stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and the calling of solemn assemblies. I cannot stand iniquity with the festival. I hate your new moons and prescribed festivals. They have become a burden to me, and I am tired of putting up with them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. 
even if you offer countless prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight, and stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Pursue justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. Come, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your skins are your skins, your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The faithful town, what an adulteress she has become. She was once full of justice. Righteousness once dwelt in her. But now, murderers. Your silver has become dross to be discarded. Your beer is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, friends of thieves. They all love graft and chase after bribes. They do not defend the rights of the fatherless, and the widow's case never comes before them. Therefore the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel declares, Ah, I will get even with my foes. I will take revenge against my enemies. Well, who are these enemies? Who are these foes of God? I will turn my hand against you and will burn away your dross completely. Didn't he just say that everything that they were was, was just dross? I will remove all of your impurities. Didn't he just tell them that they're all impure? I, re I will restore your judges to what they were at the first and your advisors to what they were at the start. Afterward, after I do these things, then you will be called the righteous city, a faithful town. Zion will be redeemed by justice, those who repent by righteousness. At the same time, both rebels and sinners will be broken, and the, those who abandon the Lord will perish. Indeed, they will be ashamed of the sacred trees you desired. Again, these are the places that they were having their orgies and their, and their um, other worship they were doing. And you will be embarrassed because of the garden shrines you have chosen. For you will become like an... Uh, I lost my spot. For you will become like an oak whose leaves are withered and like a garden without water. The strong one will become tender and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to extinguish the flames. Let's move on to Hebrews chapter 9, shall we? The author of Hebrews continues. Now, the first covenant, this is the Mosaic covenant, also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room, which is called the holy place, were the lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the most holy place. It had the altar of, of gold, rather, it had the gold altar of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant, covered with gold on all its sides, in which was a gold jar containing the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, we'll get there, and the tables of the covenant, or the tablets of the covenant. The cherubim of glory were over, rather, were above the ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. It is not possible to speak of these things in detail right now. Not saying he doesn't know it. He's saying that he's writing a letter. He doesn't want to write for 10 pages about the glory of these things. With things prepared like this, the priests first enter the first room repeatedly. It's a regular room that they go in to perform their work, uh, performing, their, performing their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room, 
the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And he does that only once per year on Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. And never without blood. He has to have the blood come with him as the sacrifice in his place, which he offers first for himself and then for all the sins of the people, uh, all the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed without, sorry, while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol for the present time, during which uh, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. They can't resolve anything. They are physical regulations and only deal with food, drink, and various washings imposed until the time of the new order. But Christ has appeared as a, as a high priest of the good things that have, past tense, already come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, one not made with hands, that is not of this earthly creation, he entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish, a truly sinless man, to God? How much will he cleanse our, or rather, how much will his blood cleanse our consciences from dead works? so that we can serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Where a will exists, uh, the, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will is valid only when people die, since it is never in effect when the person who made it is still living. That is why the, even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when every animal has been proclaimed by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water, scarlet wool and hyssop. Remember this? And sprinkled the scroll itself and then also all the people who were present. Saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God has ordained for you. Remember what the people said? They said, Amen, we will obey. In the same way, he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the articles of worship with blood. According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. Why? Well, think about it. How many times does the priest have to go in and offer a sacrifice? Every single day. If, if, if nobody shows up, he still has to go and offer sacrifices for himself because he himself is a sinner. So he has to continually do this over and over and over and over and over again. But this new one, given by God, given through um, Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, who every minute of every day, only did that which most glorified God the Father. In the same way that you and I uh, only ever do that which glorifies ourselves, Jesus only ever did that which glorified God every single time. That's why his is lasting. That's why his doesn't have to be redone. Because his was perfect. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of these things in the heavens to be purified 
with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with sacrifices better than these. That's what that means. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, only a model of the true one, but into heaven itself, so that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. He did not do this to offer himself many times, sorry Catholics, as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another, right? Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it, appoint, it, is, just as it is appointed for people to die once and after this judgment, so also Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will bear, rather, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And there is all of the notes. And that is all for today. So, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord. <laughs>